eternal life is a free gift from God. Jesus died for you at Calvary. He is the way, the truth, the life, the door. If you believe in him, you shall be saved. Cause God's free gift to you is eternal life through Jesus Christ the Lord. Greetings and welcome. My name is Pastor David McKivick. And this is the Living Truth Broadcast, brought to you through Full Gospel Evangelism, a ministry that is dedicated to bringing the gospel to the world. In this ministry, we believe that all the gifts of the Spirit, every one of them speaking in tongues, the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, prophesy that all the gifts of the Spirit are in the true church today and none have ceased. We also believe that there is a fivefold ministry. Every one of the fivefold ministry is in the church today. None of the gifts have ceased and they will remain in the church until Jesus returns. In this ministry we believe in the power of prayer and we take prayer very, very seriously. And if you have a prayer request, we would like to pray for you. The telephone number to call us on is 07778690931. I say that number again, it's 07778690931. If you didn't get it, don't worry, just get a pen and paper, because I promise you, I will give it to you at the end of this broadcast. Before I go into the message, I'd like to let you know that we do go out on Sky Television every Wednesday at 5.30pm, channel 589. That's Sky Channel 589 at 5.30. The television channel is called Faith Well Television. Well, we are now going to go straight in to the Word of God. Well, we're going to go straight in to the Word of God now, because in this ministry, we believe that all doctrines and everything we believe should be backed up by Scripture. The reason I believe that the gifts of the Spirit are in the church today is because I believe the Bible. The reason I believe that there is a five-fold ministry in the church today is because I believe the Bible. I want to back up everything I say by scripture, not my opinion, but what God says. And I'm going to read to you a verse of scripture that is found in Luke chapter 11 verse 1. And I always say the scriptures twice so you get a chance to write it down and look it up. And I recommend that whenever you listen to any preacher, be it a pastor in your church, be it me or any other television minister, make a note of the scriptures, look it up afterwards, make sure that scripture is used in context of the chapter and in context of the book. Luke chapter 11 verse 1 And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he seized one of his disciples, said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. I want to give you today eight keys to a more powerful prayer life. Eight keys to a more powerful prayer life. I believe that we, the church, really need to pray as we've never prayed before. We have seen the situation as Russia invades Ukraine and as I do this broadcast one week before you watch it I don't know what the situation is going to be in Ukraine by the time you watch this broadcast but we need to pray for the church we need to pray for the people of Ukraine 
We need to pray for the government. I don't want us to hate the Russians. I don't want us to hate anybody. Remember, the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, and against the rulers of darkness, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. Yes, there are some bad people in Russia, but there are also good people in Russia. The same as in my country in England. We have some good people, we have some bad people. Not everybody in Russia wants war. Not everybody in Russia wants to see Russia invade Ukraine. So let us have love in our hearts and peace in our hearts and let us pray that God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let us unite together in prayer. And I believe that at this time, when there is distress among nations, we need to pray as we've never ever prayed before. And I want to give you eight keys to a more spiritual or more powerful prayer life. Now, the disciples said, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. When we think about this, it is amazing because these disciples were not atheists, they were Jews. They had been raised in the synagogues. They were used to prayer. They had no doubt heard the leading rabbis teach on prayer. They had heard prayers by the leading rabbis, the scribes in the church. They, in a synagogue, they heard them pray. But there was something different about the way John the Baptist prayed. There was something different about the way Jesus prayed. And they said, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. This is quite amazing, because Jesus had worked miracles. But the disciples never said, teach us to turn water into wine, teach us to raise the dead, teach us how to cast out devils, teach us how to give sight to the blind, teach us how to walk on water. He never, they never said that, but they said, teach us to pray. Why was that so important? Because when our prayer life is right, miracles come natural. Revival will take place. Lives will be transformed. People will be saved. You can't teach people to work miracles because there's only one miracle worker, and that is Jesus. I make no claim to be a healer. I make no claim to be a miracle worker. But when you phone me and ask me to pray, I will pray with you. But I want you to pray for yourself as well. I will pray for you that the one who is the miracle worker, the one who is the healer, the one who is the saviour, will meet your need. That is not Pastor McKivitt. That is Jesus Christ. He alone is the healer. Stay away from people who claim to be a healer. The Apostle Paul never claimed to be a healer. Peter never claimed to be a healer. They claimed Jesus was the healer. And when Peter met the man at the gate of Beautiful, he said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I unto thee in the name of Jesus. Notice it was in Jesus' name. He is the healer. Praise the living God. I'm not a healer. He is the healer. But there was something different about the way Jesus and John prayed. I have met Christians who pray religious prayers. But I've also met people that when they pray, you feel like you're in the presence of God. There is something different about the way some people pray. There are those that pray the religiosity prayers with their religious phrases and religious tone of voice. But there are others that pray under the anointing of God. And when they pray for you, you can feel the presence of God. You can feel the anointing of God. Prayer is so important. 
you will never grow any higher than your prayer life. I have never ever met a great man or woman of God who was not a great prayer warrior. I have studied church history. I have looked at great men and I noticed they had one thing in common. They all had a powerful prayer life. John Knox, Charles Spurgeon, many of the great charismatic Pentecostal leaders, they had a great prayer life. Prayer is so important. I would rather be prayed up than have a PhD or an MA in theology, and there's nothing wrong with having a PhD or an MA or a BA or a diploma in theology. Nothing wrong with that. I recommend you get one. But I tell you, you without the anointing of God, without a Holy Ghost prayer life, it doesn't do any good. As I said, there are some that pray, but others who really pray. Jesus spoke to some people one time about two men that went to pray. Let me read it for you. Luke 18, verses 9 to 11. I repeat, Luke 18, verses 9 to 11. I don't have time in this broadcast to read the whole of the chapter, but notice something happened here. And he, that's Jesus, and he spoke this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed lust with himself. Notice what it says, he prayed lust with himself. He was a religious leader, full of pride. Read the whole chapter, read what he says. I don't have time, but he prayed lust with himself. God is not interested in our religious prayers with all the lees and lows and changing our tone of voice to sound more religious. We put on our religious tone. Oh God, we come to you. You know, God is not interested in our religious tone. He just wants us to be natural, to talk to him as we talk to our Father. All our religious prayers, with our self-righteousness, we just pray to ourselves. And that's what the Bible says, he prayed lust for himself. And there are lots of Christians that pray. They put on prayer shows. They're more interested in how they sound when they pray, rather than whether God is hearing them or not. Those prayers never go beyond the ceiling. They pray to themselves, which means they're never heard of God. But I want to give you eight keys to a more powerful prayer life. And these are prayer principles that we all need to pray. It's interesting that when Jesus was asked the question, Teach us to pray. As John taught his disciples, he gave them what is commonly called the Lord's Prayer. Now the Lord never prayed that prayer himself. Jesus never prayed that prayer. Believe me, Jesus never had to pray, forgive me my sins, as I forgive others that sinned against me, because Jesus never sinned. He was teaching us to pray. When Jesus gave that prayer, he didn't just want us to recite it. He was teaching us a lesson on praying. We can say, Our Father, which art in heaven, that will be thy name, thy kingdom come. We can say it, we can quote it, we can memorise it, but that is not praying it. Quoting a scripture, memorising a scripture is not praying. Jesus was giving them principles of prayer. Let's take a look at it. The, the key to a powerful prayer life. Number one, know to whom you are speaking. In Luke 11 verse 2, Luke 11 verse 2, And Jesus said unto them, When ye pray, 
say our Father which art in heaven. Focus on him. Don't focus on putting on a show for other people. Trying to show how wonderful you are. Just pray to him. And in fact, I recommend that you spend more time praying by yourself than with others. There's nothing wrong in praying in a church, nothing wrong in praying in front of other people. That is good. But we should spend more time alone in our prayers. Because that way all distractions go. And we're not concerned about anybody hearing us because there's nobody there. We can just focus on the Lord. He said, when you pray, say, Our Father. Our Father talks of a relationship with him. This, is, this prayer was given to people that have come into an experience, into a relationship with God. And the first prayer is, Our Father. Now, if you're not a Christian, your first prayer should be to confess your sins, to ask the Lord to save you. And if you want to know more about salvation, phone that number. We are there to help you. The focus of our prayer should be on him. Number two, come with thanks. Don't just come before God and just say, Oh God, I need a miracle. God, I need a healing. God, I need deliverance. There used to be a song in the 60s. And the song was, Give me that, give me that, give me, give me, give me that, give me that thing. And too many Christians pray that way. They come before God. Oh, give me this, give me that, I want, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me that thing. No, that's not the way to approach him. We should come with thanks. In Psalms 100, verse 4, Psalms 100, verse 4, it says, Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his court with praise. Be faithful unto him and bless his name. That's how we should come with thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord, for a good night's sleep. Thank you, Lord, for the food that I've eaten. Thank you, Lord, for my parents. Thank you for my wife. I always thank God for my parents, even though they're no longer with me. I thank God for my late wife, for God for giving me a wonderful wife. I thank God for all things that, thank God for, for my eyes, my ears, that I can walk, that I can talk. Maybe you've got a bad leg. We pray about the bad leg. But what about giving God thanks for the good one? What about giving God thanks? You may not have the best house, but thank God you've got a roof over your head. As my dear late mother-in-law used to say, there's always people worse than yourself. So learn to give thanks. Jesus did that. In one of his greatest miracles, when he multiplied the loaves and the fishes, we read in Mark 8 verse 6, Mark 8 verse 6, And he commanded the people to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves and gave thanks and break it. Notice he gave thanks. I tell you, friends, gratitude precedes a miracle. Focus it on him. I read over and over again where people, when they came to Jesus for a miracle, before they asked for a miracle, they fell down and worshipped him. The leper fell down and worshipped him. Appreciated who he is. Worship, thanksgiving, is the key to an answered prayer. And when he gave thanks to his disciples, he gave to his disciples and set before them, and they did set before people, and over 5,000 people were fed. Thanksgiving, gratitude, brings miracles. And then we read how Jesus gave thanks before the raising of Lazarus. In John 11, 41, John 11, 41, Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. Do you come before God with thanksgiving? Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Enter his courts with praise. Declare this is the day that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice, for he hath made me glad. Don't rush into prayer. Take time. Appreciate God. Spend time. Quality time with God. Somebody said to me, pardon me, can we should I pray for an hour or two hours? Let me think, it's not how long you pray. It's the quality of your prayer. 
Prayer should not be an endurance. It should be a relationship. It's something that you want to do. You don't. I don't time my prayer if I pray for an hour. I mean, I wouldn't go to my late wife and say, well, I'm going to set my watch and how long I'm going to talk to you. No, we just, quality time is better than the quantity of time. And you will find that as you enter into that relationship with the loving God and appreciate Him, you will find your prayers time will increase naturally without you struggling to pray for an hour. Number three. Number three, after God's will. God will never do anything against his will, no matter how much you pray. Ask for God's will. I had somebody say to me, Pastor Kibbit, I'm going to fast. I want to marry that man, and I'm going to fast until God says yes. I said, that's not fasting. That's a hunger strike. You don't fast until God says yes. You pray to find out God's will concerning that relationship. Does God want you to marry that man? Does God want you to go to that country? Does God want you to go to that church? Does God want you to start your business? You don't pray until God says yes, you pray until you hear the will of God. God's will concerning your situation. Luke 11 verse 2, and he said unto them, when you pray, say, our Father which charge in heaven, hallowed be thy name, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Not my will, but thy be done. Do you want me to have this? Do you want me, how do, should I speak to that person? Should I speak to that person? How do I deal with that situation? Not my will, but thy be done. God doesn't bless your will. He blesses his will. His will. When our prayers are in line with God, he will answer our Prayer. Say what, number four, number four, say what you need. Be specific in your prayer. There are some people that use a lot of religious sayings in their prayer, but when they're finished, they've said nothing. Be specific. If somebody wants something from me, it's no good coming and beating around the bush. Get to the point, say what you need. In Luke chapter 11 verse 3, which talks about the Lord's Prayer, it says, give us, to, give us day by day our daily bread. Or another translation, give us today our daily bread. What do you need from God today? What do you need from God? Do you need finance, finances to meet your, to meet your needs? You know, God will provide for all our needs. He may not provide for all our wants, but he will provide for all our needs. What do you need from God? Do you need a miracle? Do you want your son, your daughter saved? Do you want your country to be blessed, your country to be revived? Do you want the gospel to go out into the, all the world? Pray for that. Pray for that. Say what you need. And when you phone me for prayer, that telephone number is there. Tell me what you want God to do for you. And if it's in line with God's will, we will pray for it. We will pray for it. God will only answer prayer according to his will. I had somebody phone me up one time and said, Pastor McKibbit, I've met this man. Can you pray that God will allow me to divorce my husband? so that I can marry this man. I said, no, 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 no. I will not pray that prayer. That is contrary to the word of God. So number four, say what you need. Number five, ask for forgiveness. Ask for forgiveness. If you know that there are things in your life, ask for forgiveness. Luke 11, verse 4. Luke 11, verse 4. It said, and forgive us our sins as we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not in a temptation, but deliver us from evil. Ask God to forgive you. Before you come with all your wants and all your needs, confess your sins and turn away from them. The Bible says if we harbour iniquity in our hearts, the Lord will not hear us. 
If we harbour iniquity in our heart, the Lord will not hear us. Number six, pray for others and not just yourself. Notice how many times in the Bible it says us and our, not me and I. I'll say that again. Notice how many times in the prayer the Lord gave us it says us and our. Notice our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Give us this day our daily prayer and, del and deliver us from evil. Forgive us our sins. It's about us, not just praying about yourself, but praying for other people. Reaching out to other people. Pray for your brother in your church, your wife, your husband, other people's needs. If you go to church and some the pastor stands up and says, Sister such and such is in hospital, write it down. Pray for that person. Pray for your country. Pray for your in England. Pray for that president of you. You may not have voted for that president. You may not even like your president. But pray for those in authority. Pray for your pastor. Pray for your bishop. Pray for your brothers and sisters. Pray for each one. Because, friends, when we learn to pray for others, we will get the victory. Let me, let me say a few more words on number six. Pray for others and not just yourself. I know we've already mentioned that point, but it's worth saying a few more things. When we reach out and pray for others, God is going to meet our need. When we bless others, we're going to be blessed. The Bible says, give and it shall be given unto you. I know a lot of churches use that to talk about offerings, but it's more than just offering. When we reach out to bless other people, God will make sure that we are blessed. Whatsoever a man sow, that shall he also reap. Take a look at James chapter 5 verse 16. It says, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Notice those words, pray one for another that ye may be healed. If you are sick, don't just pray for yourself. Pray for someone else that is sick. Reach out on behalf of somebody else. Because as you reach out to bless others, God will bless you. Number seven, pray according to the word. In other words, make sure that you are living in obedience. A disobedient person will not get their prayers answered. In John 15 verse 7, John 15 verse 7, it says, If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done. No, it's abide, that means staying with the Lord, living for Jesus, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, making sure that we do not depart from him, that whatever we do in word or deed, we are going to do it to his honour and to his glory. It says, ye abide in me and my words abide in you. That doesn't mean just memorising scripture, it means obeying him. Walking in obedience, and then he promised, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Number eight, pray in the leading and in the power of the Holy Spirit. i say that again, pray in the leading and in the power of the Holy Spirit. We should pray under the anointing of God. In fact, whatever we do, we must do it under the anointing. We must pray with power, pray with authority, not timid prayers. We don't have to pray timid. The Bible says we can come boldly before the throne of God and pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. In Romans 8, 26, Romans 8, 26, it says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. 
that the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Do you find that? Do you find it hard to pray? Do you find it so difficult to think about things to pray about? Well, we pray in the Holy Spirit. And I do believe in praying in tongues. I do believe, Paul said, I will pray in the Spirit. I will pray with my understanding also. So to pray in the Spirit, it means you're not praying with your understanding. But that's why I believe that the gift of tongues is so great. It enhances my prayer life. I've learned to pray in English. Or you can pray whatever language you come from. But also to pray in the Spirit. And when I pray in the Spirit, I find more things to pray for. We don't always know what to pray for. But God knows. The Holy Spirit in us knows our needs. He knows what we are feeling. Sometimes it's hard to express ourselves in our own native language. But the Spirit can reach out and pray for us in ways that we cannot pray for ourselves. The Spirit makes an intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe that's what Peter and John did. Peter and John was on their way to the temple to pray. But they was already prayed up on their way to pray. And when they met the man at the gate of beautiful, they didn't have to go into the temple to pray. Because they were already prayed up. There have been some people, well, let me go and spend a few hours in prayer and then I'll come back and pray for you. No, they were already prayed up. We need to be prayed up all the time. We need to be prayed up on our way to the prayer meeting, on our way to the service. And Peter was already prayed up and he knew what he had. And look what he said. Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. When we are fully prayed up, we don't need to pray for the sick. We can just speak the word. Do you realise in the Bible, Jesus never prayed for a sick person? Now, I never said he didn't pray. We know he prayed. Sometimes he prayed all night. He got up early to pray. But when Jesus met a sick person, he didn't pray for them. He just said, rise and be healed. Take up thy bed and walk. Be now cleansed. He didn't pray for the devils to come out. He commanded the devils to come out. Someone says that's Jesus. Well, it's also Peter. Peter didn't pray for the man at the gate of the temple. He just said in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. When we pray up, we can spend time in prayer. We can come with authority. I always say, friends, the victory is run one in the prayer closet. Preachers need to be prayed up before they come to the pulpit. They must make sure that they have reached heaven and stand behind the pulpit in the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So let me run through those eight points very quickly. Number one, know to whom you are speaking. Number two, come with thanks. Number three, ask for God's will. Number four, say what you need. Number five, ask for forgiveness. Number six, pray for others, not just yourself. Number seven, Pray by the living word. Make sure your life is lined up with the word. And number eight, pray in the leading and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, we have come to the end of this broadcast. Let me just remind you of those telephone numbers that you can call us on. 07778690931. That is 0 seven 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 eight six nine zero nine three one well we have come to the end of the broadcast eternal life is a free gift from god
Jesus died for you at Calvary. He is the way, the truth, the life, the door. If you believe in him, you shall be saved. Cause God's free gift to you is eternal life through Jesus Christ the Lord.